Welcome. My name is Rod Arnold. I am a member of the Wessex branch of the Western Front Association. We are a registered educational charity dedicated to improving knowledge and understanding of all aspects of the First World War. From 2014 to 2018, I participated in Bournemouth Council's programme to commemorate the centenary of the First World War. This included ceremonies to unveil flagstones dedicated to Cecil Reginald Noble and Frederick Charles Riggs, who were both awarded the Victoria Cross. I wrote an article about Noble for our branch newsletter, The Dugout, in 2015, and collected information to write about Riggs after his flagstone was unveiled in 2018, but came to the conclusion that the story of the Capstone Road VCs might make an interesting talk for a non-specialist audience. I moved to Bournemouth in 2003. An acquaintance who shared my interest in the First World War, my wife calls it an obsession, recommended the late Mike Edgington's book, Bournemouth and the First World War. A downloadable copy is available online following an initiative from the Moordown Local History Society. Edgington identified 11 VC winners with links of some sort to the area. Only two, Noble and Riggs, were born locally. Both had connections to Capstone Road. We begin with some background about the Victoria Cross, followed by the stories of Noble and Riggs. Finally, we should look at how Noble, Riggs and others have been commemorated. Britain's highest military decoration for gallantry is a bronze cross, 41 millimetres high and 36 millimetres wide, bearing St Edward's crown, a lion and the words, For Valour. The inscription originally proposed was, For the Brave. Queen Victoria suggested the change to avoid any inference that only winners of the medal were considered brave. The decoration weighs just 27 grams. The recipient's name, rank, number and unit are engraved on the back of the suspension bar. The reverse of the medal shows the date of the act which led to the award. Before 1850, Britain had no arrangements for recognising military bravery. Honours such as the Order of the Bath, promotions and mentions in dispatches usually went to officers serving closely with the field commander, often on his own staff. Other European countries had gallantry awards that did not discriminate by class or rank. France introduced the Légion d'honneur in 1803, and the German Iron Cross dates back to 1813. The Crimean War was the first conflict regularly reported in the British press. Acts of bravery by servicemen of all ranks were described, and there was public pressure to recognise these. On the 29th of January 1856, the Victoria Cross was introduced. The effective date was made 1854, to include the Crimean War. The earliest VC went to a junior naval officer, Charles Lucas, serving in the Baltic. On the 21st of June 1854, a Russian explosive shell landed on his ship. Lucas picked up the shell and threw it overboard before it detonated. The first VC awards ceremony was held on the 26th of June 1857 in Hyde Park. Over 100,000 people watched Queen Victoria present 62 of the 111 Crimean War VCs. Until 1918, the medal ribbon was red for soldiers and dark blue for sailors. A universal red ribbon was specified after the Royal Air Force was formed. The original regulations did not mention posthumous awards and official policy was not to make them. To be awarded a VC, one had to survive. Between 1857 and 1899, the London Gazette named six servicemen who would have been awarded the Victoria Cross had they survived. A further three were named in September 1900 
and three more in April 1901. In August 1902, posthumous VCs were awarded to the most recent six. Five years later, medals were sent to the next of kin of the six named before 1899. Posthumous awards were now allowed. One quarter of all World War I VCs were posthumous. Male civilians serving alongside the armed forces were made eligible for the VC in 1858, and four civilians were so recognised during the Indian Mutiny. Women were excluded until 1920, but one female received a special award prior to that date. Elizabeth Weber Harris was the wife of the commanding officer of the 104th Bengal Fusiliers, later renamed the Royal Munster Fusiliers. During a cholera outbreak at Peshawar in 1869, she risked her life nursing six soldiers. With the Queen's approval, officers of the regiment presented Elizabeth Harris with a gold medal, similar to a Victoria Cross, to recognise her indomitable pluck. The award is not an official VC. The greatest number of VCs for deeds performed on a single day is 24 on the 16th of November 1857 during the Indian Mutiny. All but one of these was earned at Lucknow, including the first to go to a black man. The highest number won by a single unit in one action is the seven awarded to the 24th foot at Rourke's Drift in the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, the subject of this painting by Alphonse de Neuville. The action featured in the 1964 film Zulu. If you are familiar with the film, you may have noticed that I named the unit as the 24th foot and not the South Wales borderers. The film received positive reviews, but is misleading. In 1879, the regimental title was the 24th Foot, 2nd Warwickshire Regiment. It was renamed the South Wales Borderers after army reorganisation in 1881. Although based in Brecon, the 24th recruited principally from the Birmingham area. Of Rourke's Drift's 150-plus defenders, no more than one-fifth were Welsh. Of the 24th's seven VCs, only two were awarded to Welshmen, and one of them had been born in Monmouthshire, which in 1879 was part of England. Four VCs went to men from other units. By the way, the private hook, portrayed in the film as an ill-disciplined, insubordinate malingerer, was in fact a teetotal model soldier. Not surprisingly, the highest number of VCs won in a single conflict is the 628 awarded in the First World War. When a group of service personnel are all deemed equally deserving of the Victoria Cross, a ballot may be held. The unit's officers, NCOs and other ranks each make nominations from their own group up to a specified number. 46 Victoria Crosses have been awarded this way. The Indian Mutiny saw 29, and four went to an artillery battery in the Boer War. Six medals were allocated by ballot to the Lancashire Fusiliers, following their landing at Gallipoli in 1915. Three VCs went to the crews of the two, of two Q ships in 1917, and four medals were awarded for the Zeebrugge raid in 1918. In terms of sustained bravery over a short period, few can match Reginald Stanley Judson. In four weeks, from July to August 1918, the New Zealander's actions earned him, in succession, the Military Medal, the Distinguished Conduct Medal, and finally the Victoria Cross. His son won the Military Cross in the Second World War. Judson died aged 90 in 1972. 
I have already shown you several pictures of the Victoria Cross, but there is something exceptional about the VC on the left of this medal group. It is a VC with bar, indicating that the medal holder won the VC twice. About 30 years ago, Canada, Australia and New Zealand introduced their own Victoria Cross medal, and six have been awarded under these arrangements. Including these, the VC has been awarded 1,362 times to 1,359 individuals. Three men have won the VC twice. Arthur Leake won his first VC in 1902 during the Boer War. He won the medal for the second time near Ypres in Belgium in 1914. Noel Chavez won his first VC on the Somme in 1916. His second at Passchendaele the following year was posthumous. He also won the Military Cross. It was Chavez's medals on the previous slide. Leek and Chavez were both Royal Army Medical Corps officers. New Zealander Charles Upham won his VCs on Crete in 1941 and at the First Battle of El Alamein in 1942. Wounded, he was captured and sent to Kolditz. On the subject of double gallantry awards, William Manley is the only man to be awarded both a Victoria Cross and a German Iron Cross. Asked to name the youngest VC winner, many would say boy seaman Jack Cornwell, who was 16 years and four months old. He is, in fact, the third youngest. Two recipients were both just over 15 when they won the medal, more than a year younger than Jack Cornwell. The oldest VC recipient was nearly 62. Under the VC regulations, a medal may be forfeit if the holder displays disreputable conduct later in life, even as a civilian. Between 1881 and 1908, eight men were required to surrender their medal. Their offences included desertion on active service, assault and theft of a comrade's medals, embezzlement, various examples of theft, including stealing a cow, and bigamy. King George V held the view that there were no circumstances under which a VC holder should be required to return his medal. There have been no forfeitures since 1908. Time for the story of Cecil Reginald Noble, the first Bournemouth-born VC. Noble's award-winning action involved his comrade-in-arms, Harry Daniels. We'll meet Harry later. The blue plaque on 175 Capstone Road in Bournemouth. The cinema rarely portrays historical events with total accuracy. Blue plaques, too, are not always totally reliable. Noble was not born here, and I am not making the old Benny Hill joke that no one was ever born halfway up a wall. The only evidence I have found linking Noble to 175 Capstone Road is the entry in Edgington's book. More of this later. Cecil's father was Frederick Noble, a house painter from Yeovil. Frederick married Hannah Smith, a butcher's daughter, in 1888. Sarah came from Buxted in Sussex. At the time of the marriage, she was living at Wentworth Lodge, Boscombe. This was the summer residence of Viscount Portman, so perhaps she was a domestic servant there. The 1891 census, taken on the 5th of April, shows them at 18 Tower Road in Boscombe, with a daughter, Florence Gertrude, born in 1889. Hannah must have been pregnant, because her son was born just two months later, on the 4th of June, at 18 Tower Road, not at 175 Capstone Road. And here's the proof, the entry in the Register of Births. It may have been his personal choice 
bore a family nickname, that Cecil was known as Tom or Tommy to his friends. I shall use Tommy hereafter. One source states the nobles had two other children who died as infants. They may have been two boys, both named Frederick Charles Noble. The first was born early in 1890 and the second in 1892. Both died within a few weeks of their respective births. Tommy's education began at St Clement's schools. Posthumous tribute in the Bournemouth graphic said he shone with distinction there. Between 1891 and 1901, the family moved to nearby Lincoln Avenue. He may have been Tommy to his friends and family, but he appears as Cecil R. Noble, aged nine, in the 1901 census. His house painter father is shown as a worker, indicating that he was an employee, possibly of his elder brother, Louis Alexander Noble, who ran a painting and decorating business from Holdenhurst Road. Tommy won a scholarship to East Bournemouth School of Science, Art and Technical Instruction, situated in Drummond Road. Today's Arch University Bournemouth traces its history back to this and other local institutions founded in the late 19th century. Two drawings he completed at Drummond Road were accepted at the National Art Training School in South Kensington, which provided training for teachers in art and scientific principles. Despite this apparent potential, Tommy worked as a decorator for his father until the 31st of March 1910, when he joined the army. Over two-thirds of the records of British other ranks from the First World War were destroyed by bombing in 1940. Fortunately, Tommy Noble and Frederick Riggs' records have both survived, albeit damaged. We have a physical description of the 19-year-old Tommy Noble, who reported as Private 3697 at the Rifle Brigade Depot in Winchester the day after signing on in Bournemouth. Over 5 foot 8 tall, he weighed just under 10 stone. He had a fresh complexion, brown hair and brown eyes. Tommy gave his parents' address at the time as 335 Holdenhurst Road, not Capstone Road. The 1911 census, taken on Sunday the 2nd of April, shows Frederick and Hannah Noble at 335 Holdenhurst Road. Number 337 was occupied by Frederick's widowed sister-in-law, Sarah Jane Noble. Frederick's elder brother, Louis, had died in 1901, aged just 38. Frederick now appears as an employer, suggesting he had taken over the family business. The properties are at the junction with Capstone Road and opposite Lincoln Avenue, where Frederick and Hannah were residing in 1901. Tommy's sister Florence was working as a dressmaker in London and living at a Paddington boarding house. After basic training at Winchester, Tommy Noble joined the Rifle Brigade's 1st Battalion in Dublin. He received seven days' detention for using obscene language to an NCO. In November 1911, he was transferred to the 2nd Battalion in India. Tommy would have been amongst a group of soldiers sent out to replace men returning to the UK at the end of their term of engagement. When Britain declared war on Germany on the 4th of August 1914, Tommy's battalion was at Kuldana Barracks, northeast of Islamabad in today's Pakistan. Army mobilisation included sending some territorial force units from the UK to Imperial outposts to enable regular army battalions stationed abroad to return and deploy to the continent. The Bournemouth-based 7th Battalion of the Hampshire Regiment was one of the territorial force units sent out to India and Tommy Noble's battalion was one that travelled in the opposite direction. Tommy's battalion left Bombay aboard the troopship Dongola on the 20th of September 1914. 
They disembarked at Liverpool on the 22nd of October and moved to Hursley Park at Winchester to prepare for the Western Front. It may seem confusing, but the Rifle Brigade was not a brigade in organisational terms. It was a regiment. Regiments are made up of several individual battalions. Battalions, usually from different regiments, are grouped into brigades. Tommy's unit was the Rifle Brigade's second battalion, one of 12 battalions withdrawn from India, Egypt, Malta, Aden and South Africa and grouped into three brigades, each of four battalions, to form the 8th Division. The 8th Division moved to France in November 1914. Tommy's battalion landed at Le Havre on the 6th. By the time they reached the front in Flanders, the 1914 campaign was largely over. Troops prepared for winter in the trenches, with occasional patrols, local raids and exchanges of fire. Following the German invasion of France and Belgium in 1914, the Allied line was held from the North Sea to just north of Ypres by Belgian and French troops. The British covered from Ypres down to southwest of Lille in French Flanders. The French army held from there to the Swiss border. Early in 1915, the French planned attacks in the areas around Reims and Verdun to begin the liberation of occupied territory. In conjunction with a third French attack near Arras, the British would mount their first set-piece offensive of the war at Neuve-Chapelle. I'll now introduce you to Tommy's comrade, Harry Daniels. Harry was a baker's son, born at Wymundham in Norfolk. He and his seven siblings were orphaned by 1894. Harry was apprenticed to a Norfolk stop, recommence, slide 31. I'll now introduce you to Tommy's comrade, Harry Daniels. Harry was a baker's son, born at Wymundham, in Norfolk. He and his seven siblings were orphaned by 1894. Harry was apprenticed to a Norwich carpenter, but in 1903 he joined the regular army. The 2nd Battalion Rifle Brigade moved to India in 1905 and remained there until the outbreak of war. Harry was an acting sergeant with the battalion in 1911 and had been promoted to Company Sergeant Major by 1914. Tommy and Harry served together in India for three years and became good friends. In India, Harry married Mary Kathleen Perry. Unfortunately, I have been unable to discover this lady's background. The marriage appears to have been childless. The photograph was probably taken in Norwich in June 1915, after Harry had received his VC from the King. The British aim at Nerve Chapelle was to capture the high ground of Oberz Ridge. Success would threaten the German occupation of the major French city of Lille to the east. The front line runs bottom left to top right on this map. Note the woods known as Bois de Billet and Neville Chapelle village. Stop, repeat, slide 33. The British aim at Nerve Chapelle was to capture the high ground of Oberz Ridge. Success would threaten the German occupation of the major French city of Lille to the east. The front line runs bottom left to top right on this map. Note the woods known as Bois de Billet and Nerve Chapelle village. This recent photograph shows the ground between Nerve Chapelle village and Billet Woods, all just behind the German front line prior to the battle. Noble was to win the VC in this area. The British plan was for two of the divisions involved to advance either side of Nerve Chapelle village, the 8th to the north and the Meerut division from the Indian army to the south. In the early years of the war, our town hall was a hospital for Indian troops 
so it should come as no surprise to Bournemouth people that the Indian Army played a significant role on the Western Front. Indian troops provided up to one quarter the British strength in France and Belgium in 1914-15. The bombardment that began at 7.30am on the 10th of March came from 350 field guns and howitzers, the largest concentration of British artillery yet seen in the war. One soldier said, The din was terrific. The air and the solid earth itself became one quivering jelly. After 30 minutes, the barrage moved to the German rear positions, and the British and Indian infantry advanced. At first, all went well. The assaulting troops broke through the enemy front line. Tommy's battalion captured Neuve Chapelle village and met up with Indian troops. Incidentally, the first of nine VCs to be awarded in the battle had already been earned by rifleman Gobar Singh Nagy of the Gawal Rifles. His award was posthumous. Unfortunately, not all objectives were taken. Second Rifle Brigade was left holding a stretch of front partway between the village and the woods, roughly near the football pitch in the middle distance of this recent photograph. German reinforcements rushed to the area. The next day has been described as one of little real movement but considerable loss of life, occasioned by abortive attempts to assail unassailable German positions. The final day, 12th of March, began with a German counter-attack intended to recapture Neuve Chapelle village. This was repulsed with heavy losses and the British then made two further attempts to advance towards Aubert's Ridge. Tommy and his comrades had now been in action under heavy fire for over two days on limited rations. They were wet, cold and very weary. Their first attack went in about 12.30pm towards the woods. They had to advance over 400 yards over ploughed ground, intercepting Stop. Recommence slide 39. Tommy and his comrades had now been in action under heavy fire for over two days on limited rations. They were wet, cold and very weary. Their first attack went in about 12.30pm towards the woods. They had to advance 400 yards over ploughed ground intersected by drainage dikes against massed machine gun fire. The attack was halted after 45 minutes, with negligible gains. At 5.15pm, the battalion attacked again. Hampered by belts of barbed wire, they were cut down by any enemy fire as they tried to go forward. To make progress, something would have to be done about the wire. Harry Daniels and Tommy Noble crawled out under a hail of bullets to work on the entanglements with wire cutters. They were able to cut the bottom strands lying flat, but as they worked their way upwards into the tangle, they had to kneel and became easy targets. Harry Daniels was hit in the thigh, and Tommy Noble received a bullet in his chest. Both passed through various stages of assessment and treatment back to hospitals near the Channel Coast, but Tommy died at Number 10 Base Hospital near Saint-Omer the next day. Tommy Noble is buried in this Commonwealth Wargrave Cemetery just outside Saint-Omer. The cemetery has 2,874 Commonwealth Great War graves and some from World War II. Other burials include Germans, Belgians, Czechs, Poles, Indians and Chinese. In addition to the Victoria Cross, Tommy Noble was awarded the 1914 star with the clasp granted to the men who later became known as the Old Contemptibles, the War Medal and the Victory Medal. This tribute to him appeared in the Bournemouth Graphic on the 7th of May 1915. 
Tommy's comrade Harry Daniels survived. After treatment at Hammersmith Hospital, he received his VC from the King at Buckingham Palace on the 15th of May. Commissioned in July 1915, he returned to France and was reported killed in action. The error was realised when field postcards arrived from him. In March 1916, Harry Daniels was awarded the Military Cross for rescuing wounded comrades. Wounded again in July 1916, he spent the rest of the war training recruits. He boxed in the 1920 Antwerp Olympic Games and finally retired from the army in 1942 as a lieutenant colonel. Harry then ran the Crown Hotel at Woodbridge, Suffolk and later managed the Grand Theatre and Opera House in Leeds. He died on his 69th birthday in a Leeds hospital. Before relating Frederick Riggs' story, I want to explore the noble family's Capstone Road connection. Stop, recommence, slide 44. Before relating Frederick Riggs' story, I want to explore the noble family's Capstone Road connection. The only document I have found linking the noble family to 175 Capstone Road is Edgington's book. We know that in 1911, Tommy's parents were at 333 Holdenhurst Road. None of the pre-1911 records I have seen shows them in Capstone Road. By 1911, Tommy was with the army in Ireland. The following year, he was serving in India. The earliest reference I have found so far linking the family to Capstone Road is the Electoral Register for 1914, which shows Tommy's father at 105 Capstone Road, although the 1914 edition of Mate's Directory also lists him still at 335 Holdenhurst Road. The family probably moved to 105 Capstone Road in late 1913 or early 1914, when Tommy was in India. They moved again within a year. Mate's 1915 edition gives the family address as 172 Capstone Road. The probate index for Tommy's father, who died in February 1916, also has the address as 172. According to Mates, throughout the period 1911 to 1919, 175 Capstone Road was occupied by Mr and Mrs G Brewer. An army form completed by Tommy's mother in 1919, Commonwealth War Graves records, post-war electoral rolls, a press report of 1934 and the National Registration of 1939 all give Tommy's mother's address as 172 Capstone Road. Tommy's only opportunity to visit his parents in Capstone Road would have been if he was allowed any leave in the fortnight between his return from India in October 1914 and his departure for France in early November, when they were probably at 105 Capstone Road. He may never have visited Capstone Road at all. Tommy's sister Florence married in 1923. She remained with her widowed mother at 172 Capstone Road until Hannah died in 1945. Florence and her husband continued to live there until the 1960s. This postcard is typical of the patriotic items published in the war's early months. This one highlights Bournemouth, but the design was probably available nationwide with the local town name inserted. The second Bournemouth-born VC was Frederick Charles Riggs. The Wargraves Commission Commemorative Certificate describes him as the adopted son of Elizabeth Burgham of 39 Capstone Road. The house was demolished some years ago and this blue plaque appears on number 45. The site of 39 Capstone Road was by the retaining wall of this slip road off the northbound Wessex Way. Frederick's natural family is a matter of conjecture. 
but it appears that his maternal ancestors came from Chesselbourne, a village situated between Blandford and Dorchester. He was born Frederick Charles Reeks, R-E-E-K-S, in the Christchurch Union Workhouse on the 28th of July, 1888. His mother was named as Mildred Reeks, a domestic servant. No father was listed. All subsequent records give Frederick's surname as Riggs. The 1891 census shows Frederick Riggs as an orphan living with James and Elizabeth Fowler at 55 Garfield Avenue off Holdenhurst Road. The Fowlers may have been recognised foster parents because the household included another orphan. The Bergham family were living just a few doors away at 41. The young Frederick attended Malmesbury Park Council School. His school reports described him as a tough, fit young man of average attainments and full of boyish spirits. A Mildred Reeks appears in the 1891 census as an unmarried 32-year-old servant at Solent Cliffs, a private hotel in South Cliff Road, overlooking Bournemouth Pier. Mildred was born at Chesilbourne. I have found no subsequent trace of a Mildred Reeks. In 1901, Frederick is shown as the son of Anne Reeks, a 44-year-old cook lodging at 77 Durnford Road. The Bergham family were at number 39. Durnford Road was later renamed Capstone Road. Anne Riggs' birthplace was Chiselbourne, the same as Mildred Riggs. Were Mildred and Anne the same person? Several families surnamed Riggs were baptising children at Chesilbourne in the late 1850s, 1860s. But neither Mildred nor Anne have been positively identified amongst them. Anne Riggs has not been traced after 1901. I mentioned earlier that fortunately Frederick's army service record was amongst the 33% that survived. When I examined this, I found a possible clue to his maternal family. On joining the army in 1914, Frederick did not nominate any next of kin. As you can see, this later undated entry in his army service record names an aunt Mrs Palmer, address unknown. A Rose Riggs married George Palmer in 1903 in the Christchurch Registration District. The bride's father is named as Meshach Riggs. In 1911, Rose and her husband were living in Markham Road in the Winton area of Bournemouth, just a few minutes' walk from Capstone Road. The census shows Rose was born around 1868 in Chesilbourne. Dorset baptismal records show that a Rose Riggs was christened in Chesilbourne in 1868. She was the daughter of Meshach Riggs and Martha Davis, who had married in 1855. They had at least four other children. The one of most interest in my quest for Frederick's family was the eldest child, shown in census and other records as either Maricella, Marcelia or Priscilla, born in 1856. Maricella is a very unusual name and spellings vary. The ages shown for Mildred Reeks in 1891 and Anne Riggs in 1901 would suggest a birth somewhere around 1856, given the wide variations that appear in census schedules. Was Maricella Riggs Frederick's mother? Meshach Riggs was a widower by 1871 and his children all disappeared from Chesilbourne over the next few years. I have not found Maricella or Priscilla in the census after 1881, when Priscilla was living with her father in Chesilbourne. Meshach's son Frank Riggs was living in Winton in 1881 and Boscombe ten years later. 
Mildred Reeks, Frederick's mother, was obviously living in the Bournemouth area by 1888. And Rose Riggs was also in Bournemouth by 1891. Meshach Riggs lived in Chesilbourne until the 1890s. He had moved to Weymouth by 1911 and died at aged 80 at Christchurch Workhouse Infirmary in 1916. The death certificate gives his home as 50 Markham Road, Rose Palmer's address in 1911. A Marcelia Riggs, born in 1856, died at Royal Bournemouth Hospital in 1912. She is described as a resident of Moordown and the daughter of Meshach Riggs. Frederick's family remains a work in progress. The photograph shows the Christopher family, who were near neighbours of the Riggs in Chesilbourne. Frederick left school at 14 and was an errand boy before joining Pickford's as a carrier at their depot up Holdenhurst Road. By 1911, Durnford Road had become Capstone Road, and Frederick was living with the Bergen family at 39. In the census return, his status within the household was first entered as lodger, but this is scored through and replaced with boarder. He is not shown as an adopted son, after the initial rush to enlist on the outbreak of war in August 1914, recruitment slackened off until news of serious British casualties in France and Belgium later in the month prompted a further surge. Frederick volunteered on the 1st of September. Frederick joined a cavalry regiment, the 15th Hussars, and went to Bristol for training. His army record describes him as five foot five and three quarter inches tall, weighing 135 pounds, with a fair complexion, blue eyes, and fair hair. On the 7th of June 1915, Frederick was transferred to the 6th Battalion, the York and Lancaster Stop, restart slide 58. On the 7th of June 1915, Frederick was transferred to the 6th Battalion. York and Lancaster Regiment. Soldiers described the regiment's cap badge as the Cat and Cabbage. The battalion's 29 officers and 928 other ranks left Liverpool on the Aquitania on the 3rd of July and arrived at Lemnos Island off the Gallipoli Peninsula one week later. Britain and France had declared war on Turkey on the 5th of November 1914. A naval attack intended to force a way through to Constantinople in February 1915 had failed and it was decided to invade the Gallipoli Peninsula. Allied landings took place on the 25th of April 1915 at the southern end of the peninsula and at what later became known as Anzac Cove. Fierce Turkish resistance produced stalemate. In an effort to break this, additional landings were planned for August 1915 further north at Suvla Bay. Two new divisions were to land and capture the high ground overlooking Suvla Bay. Australian and New Zealand troops would advance from the Anzac Cove area and together they would break through to the peninsula's eastern coast. Frederick's unit was part of the 32nd Brigade in the 11th Division. They landed early on the 7th of August. In five days of fierce fighting, the 6th, York and Lancasters suffered 309 casualties. No breakthrough was achieved and deadlock continued. The Allies eventually decided upon total withdrawal. This was conducted in two phases between the 19th of December and the 9th of January. The evacuation turned out to be the greatest success of the campaign. The Turks were caught by surprise and the Allies suffered no casualties during the operation, although quantities of stores and equipment were destroyed or abandoned. After the evacuation, Frederick's unit garrisoned some of the Aegean islands before sailing for Egypt in February 1916. Here Frederick was promoted to Lance Corporal. 
After refitting and receiving reinforcements, the battalion left Egypt for the Western Front. They arrived at Marseille on the 3rd of July, the third day of the Battle of the Somme. During the 140 days from the 1st of July to the 18th of September 1916, the British rotated 616 battalions through the Somme battlefields. Soldiers would spend a few days in the forward positions and support trenches before returning to billets in the rear for rest. Frederick's battalion first went to the Arras sector, well to the north of the Somme action. It was early September before they came south to join the campaign. The battalion spent their tours of frontline duty around Thiepval, taking part in attack, stop, recommence, slide 65. The battalion spent their tours of frontline duty around Thiepval, taking part in attacks at Mukay Farm, known to the Tommies as Mucky Farm or Mukau Farm, Stuff Redoubt and Hessian Trench. During this period, Frederick was awarded the Military Medal. In an attack on Hessian Trench, on Friday the 29th of September 1916, Frederick received a head wound. He was treated at number 32 General Hospital at Wimmerup and was then evacuated to the UK aboard the hospital ship St. Patrick. After recovering, Frederick rejoined his old battalion in June 1917. He took part in the battles of Langemark, Polygon Wood, Brudseinde and Polkapel, all phases of the Passchendaele campaign. He was promoted to sergeant on the 10th of October 1917. We have now reached 1918. Frederick Riggs has survived Gallipoli, the Somme and Passchendaele. But for the British Army, 1918 was to prove the most costly of the war. Frederick's army records include this letter of the 10th of March 1918 from a Miss A. Watkin of 135 Pearl Street, Sheffield. She has not heard from her friend, Sergeant Riggs, for six weeks. Can the army give her any information about him? Miss Watkin does not claim to be his fiancée, but was she more than just a friend? Had his letters gone astray? Had he stopped writing? Perhaps he simply didn't have time to write. The British army was busy preparing to resist a major German attack. Between the 21st of March and the 15th of July 1918, the German army mounted five massive offensives on the Western Front. These brought the Allies closer to losing the war than at any time since 1914. All the ground gained by the British in the Somme and Passchendaele campaigns was lost. The Germans were within 56 miles of Paris before the Allies managed to stem the tide. Starting on 8th August, the British group of armies launched a series of attacks, now known as the Hundred Days, which led to the German surrender. It was a period of which Foch, the Allied commander-in-chief, said, the French were exhausted, the Americans disappointing, and the British invincible. Frederick's battalion had been in action twice in August as the British fought their way towards the extensive German defences known as the Hindenburg Line. At the end of September, they prepared to assault positions north of Cambrai. The British 11th Division were the flank guards for the main attack by the Canadian Corps and had to advance northeast towards Epinoy. The battle began on the 27th of September and the 11th Division reached Epinoy on the 29th. During these two days, known as the Battle of the Canal du Nord, Frederick's battalion had 10 men killed, 74 wounded and 5 reported missing. On the 1st of October, they were ordered to push on towards Abancourt. Frederick and his comrades moved off at 5am. His VC citation tells the rest of the story. Having led his platoon through strong, uncut wire under severe fire, 
he continued straight on, and although losing heavily from flanking fire, succeeded in reaching his objective, when he rushed in and captured a machine gun. He later handled two captured guns with great effect, and caused the surrender of 50 of the enemy. Subsequently, when the enemy again advanced in force, Sergeant Riggs cheerfully encouraged his men to resist, and whilst exhorting his men to fight on to the last, this very gallant soldier was killed. Frederick Riggs died just west of Avancourt, near the railway embankment seen here in the middle distance. Frederick's body was not identified. He is commemorated on the Visonatua Memorial, which names 9,839 men killed in Picardy and Artois between the 8th of August and the 11th of November 1918, whose burial place is unknown. Of the 2,369 burials in the adjacent cemetery, 1,458 are unidentified. 48 men from Frederick's battalion died on the 1st of October. 12, including Frederick, have no known grave and are named on the memorial. Of the 36 in marked graves, 29 are buried at Sucrerie Cemetery, located near where Frederick was killed. There are five unknown graves in this cemetery. One of them may be Frederick's last resting place. Noble and Riggs are commemorated in various places. As part of the Great War centenary commemorations, the government sponsored memorial flagstones in towns where VC winners in that conflict were born. That dedicated to Cecil Reginald Noble was unveiled by the Lord Lieutenant of Dorset, the centenary of Tommy's Act of Valour. On the same day, Tommy's friend and comrade Harry Daniels was similarly honoured in Norfolk. Frederick Riggs' commemorative flagstone was unveiled alongside Noble's on the 1st of October 2018. And yes, that is my toe cap at the bottom of the picture. Stop. Slide 80. Tommy Noble attended St Clement's School, which is still situated in St Clement's Road, Springbourne. The school journal for the 29th of April 1915 records that an old scholar had been awarded the Victoria Cross. The entry for the 7th of May mentions that the boys have put their pennies together and made up the sum of three pounds towards a fund for placing in the school a permanent memorial. The memorial was unveiled on the 1st of November 1915 by the Mayor of Bournemouth, John Druitt. This Bournemouth graphic photograph shows pupils laying a wreath at the memorial on Armistice Day in 1934. The caption mentions that the headmaster, Mr Love, had been at the school for 34 years and remembered Tommy Noble as a pupil. It also states that Tommy's widowed mother still lived in Capstone Road at 172. The memorial is still in place today. A plaque in St Clement's Church adjacent to the school commemorates Noble and other men from the parish who died in the war. Noble's name appears on the Rifle Brigade Roll of Fame in Winchester Cathedral. The S.C. Woodruff, listed below Noble, is one of Edgington's Bournemouth-linked VCs. In 1980, the Royal British Legion Housing Association opened a block of sheltered flats in Surrey Road, which they named Reginald Noble Court. The Malmesbury Park Council School, attended by Frederick Riggs in the 1890s, was sited in Selborne Road, but disappeared like 39 Capstone Road when the Wessex Way was constructed. The school now occupies the site of the former Royal Victoria Branch Hospital in Lowther Road. 
a memorial tablet to Frederick, was unveiled at the old building by the Mayor of Bournemouth, Councillor C.H. Cartwright, on Wednesday the 9th of May, 1921. This has been moved to the new school with other commemorative stones. Frederick is also named on the war memorial in nearby St Andrew's Church as a man connected with this church and parish. Two roads off Canford Avenue in Wallistown are named after the VC winners. The Tregonwell statue outside the Bic includes a scroll commemorating three Bournemouth-born VC winners, Noble Riggs and from the Second World War, Lieutenant Colonel Derek Seagrim. Derek Seagrim was the son of the curate of St Peter's Church. Coincidentally, the family lived near Capstan Road. Derek died of wounds in 1943, whilst commanding the 7th Battalion, the Green Howards, in North Africa. His four brothers all followed army careers. His brother Hugh Seagrim was not born in Bournemouth, but he was awarded the George Cross after he was executed by the Japanese in Burma. This award of the Victoria Cross and the George Cross to siblings is unique. Slide 95. My particular thanks to my WFA colleague Roger Coleman, who has allowed me to use some of his work on Noble and Riggs, and to St Clement's and St John's Infant School, Malmesbury Park Primary School, and Bournemouth Library's Heritage Collection for giving me access to material they hold. My particular thanks to my WFA colleague Roger Coleman, who has allowed me to use some of his work on Noble and Riggs, and to St Clement's and St John's Infant School, Malmesbury Park Primary School, and Bournemouth Library's Heritage Collection for giving me access to material they hold. I have decided to close by saying a bit more about the mothers, albeit one of them by adoption, of Bournemouth's two local Great War VCs. Some sources suggest Elizabeth Burgum adopted Frederick Riggs when he was five. The Burgum family almost certainly knew Frederick from when he was very young, but the only recorded link I have found between Frederick and the Burgums prior to 1919 is the 1911 census, which lists him as a 22-year-old boarder with the family. Elizabeth was widowed in 1913, when her husband George died aged 47. Early in 1919, a solicitor claimed Frederick's personal effects, but whether this was on behalf of Elizabeth Burgum or someone else such as Mrs Palmer is not known. It appears that Frederick must have made a will in favour of Elizabeth Burgum because the army authorities recognised her as Frederick's sole legatee around this time. Elizabeth was too ill to receive Frederick's VC at a public ceremony in 1919 and the medal was presented privately by the Assistant Provost Marshal for Bournemouth on the Tuesday, the 11th of May. She attended the unveiling of the memorial tablet at Malmesbury Park Schools two years later, but died in Bournemouth in 1927, aged 60. Hannah Noble lost her son in March 1915, and her husband died less than 12 months later, aged 50. She received her son's Victoria Cross from King George V at Buckingham Palace on the 29th of November 1915. She reportedly said at the time, it's not much to look at, but it signifies more than anything else in the world, doesn't it? Hannah continued to live at 172 Capstone Road until her death, aged 82, in 1945. Today, I may have questioned the links Noble and Riggs had with Capstone Road, but there is no doubt that they both spent their formative years living in neighbouring roads. They may even have known one another. We will remember them.